And as we come in willing bonds before the feet of Jesus, we want to take his word. And if you would turn with me in your copy of God's word to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians chapter 2. If you're using one of the black hardback Bibles you'll find in the seat in front of you, you'll find that on page 984. 984, Colossians chapter 2. We're picking up where we began the chapter just a couple of weeks ago, looking at verses 6 through 15, and we'll, we'll focus on verses 16 through 23 to the end of the chapter, but I want to read, begin reading in verse 6 in order to remind ourselves again of the stream of thought and the argument that the Apostle and the Holy Spirit is making to us. So Colossians chapter 2, begin reading in verse 6. And there we find it is written, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, all the fitness that you require is that we feel our need of you. And even this is the gift of your grace through the work of your Spirit. There is nothing that we can add and contribute to what you have done in your Son, Jesus, to bring us who trust him, who are Christians, into your very presence in him. Forgive us, we pray for all the ways in pride we seek to add our own efforts to your eternal finished work in your Son and continue to guard us from this ongoing temptation. We thank you, Father, for these warnings in your word. We pray that they would echo again with fruit by the work of your Spirit as they did when the Apostle Paul wrote them. Help us, Father, to hear your word with faith and seeking that you would expose our own hearts to ourselves, that we would see the pride that remains, that must be fought against with the cross. 
And Father, help the one who preaches your word. May you be with him that the preaching of your word would be your very words to your church. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. Perhaps one of the most important insights of the great reformer Martin Luther was his assertion that the cross alone is our theology. And the key word being alone. By arguing the cross alone is our theology, Luther was arguing that all our thinking about God, all the ways that we think about Him and what He does, must be done through the revealing of His wisdom in the cross of Jesus Christ. That God has paramountly and preeminently displayed His wisdom and His glory through the suffering death and resurrection of His Son Jesus on the cross. And that also means that how we look at ourselves and how we understand ourselves must always be through the cross. You see, the danger that Luther was trying to fight and argue against is that we really don't grasp how desperate our situation is in sin. That we have a tendency to minimize just how hopeless we are apart from the work of Christ. Our sin is not simply the sinful or immoral acts that we do. Our sin, at its root, is our innate pride, our self-reliance, our foolish seek search for independence from God, as if that were possible. And so we see our sin even in our religion, even in our worship and our attempts at it. We may readily admit we're badly damaged. We may easily agree that we're broken in many ways, but we often still act and deep in our hearts and our pride believe that we're fixable and that by our efforts with the right methods, the right technique, the right, the right modes of worship, the right program, that, that we can make ourselves whole again before God. And we can do this even while we're affirming the whole time that Christ died on the cross. Christ died on the cross so that I could strive and bring myself back to him. That I could put myself back together. Christ died to give me the opportunity to fix myself in these ways. Martin Luther understood from his own reflections on scripture that there's a real danger to reducing the cross to just another tool of our own pride. Just another instrument of our own self-reliance. So he asserted the cross and the cross alone is our theology. And this is what the Apostle Paul has been driving at in Colossians chapter 2. Where we begin reading in verse 6, he summarized really this book and the Christian life as simply walking or living in him. We live by abiding, remaining, leaning, and depending upon Christ for life because we're joined to him and we need everything from him and so we are to refuse in verse 8 as we looked at last time to be captivated or to be persuaded by philosophies that would suggest anything else anything built on the end of verse 8 by human tradition anything built on the ability of man's assumptions that man can fix himself no verses 9 and 10 God himself, the whole fullness of deity, has come to us bodily. God himself became a man to bring man back to God. And that's what's happened. Verse 10, you have been filled in him. You've been completed in him. It's done in Christ, the one who rules all rule and all authority. And there is only life in Christ. That's what verses 11 to 15 expound. Only in Christ do we have a circumcision made without hands. That means a circumcision of the heart, having a new heart and new life. It's only in Christ. And our union with Christ means that we've actually died with him. The body of flesh has been put off in the death of Christ. And that death has been assured, verse 12, by our baptism. We've been buried with him and sealed in him. And this by faith. Verse 12, in the powerful working of God, we've been 
raised with him and we have a new life now and the resurrection has already begun and that you have a new spirit and a new life in Christ. And that means that you're no longer who you were before Christ. The woman or the man that you were before you were joined to Christ is dead. And not just dead, they were crucified. And they're gone. And you now have new life. You're free. And that's the point of verses 13 to 15, that you have freedom. You're free from being separate from God. You're now, verse 13, alive together in Christ with Him. And we'll find out even more what that means in chapter 3. But God has raised you up in Christ to be with Him and to be as close as you can be. You're in His Son. The separation you're free from. You're no longer under His judgment, verses 13 to 14. The record of debt has been canceled. It's been shredded. It's been destroyed. It's been, end of verse 14, nailed to the cross. On that cross, while Jesus was dying, your debt, the sin that deserves God's wrath, was hammered upon the Son of God. And He bore it willingly, suffering your judgment, that He would receive your judgment, you would receive His righteousness, so that your debt is gone. It's been put in the shredder, and it's been canceled completely, totally set aside. You are free from out from under the guilt and condemnation that you deserve, liberated by the righteousness of Christ and the forgiveness of God. And that means, verse 15, you're liberated from the devil's lies and temptations. The rulers and authorities, those are demonic powers, wicked forces that have one foothold in this world, and that's our sin. To tempt us, to flee from God, to accuse us as we sin and tempt us to despair and hopelessness or tempt us that we can somehow fix it on our own. But the cross has liberated us completely. Christ has exposed them shamefully with his work on the cross. They have nothing. If you're in Christ, the devil and his demons, they have nothing to accuse you of. It's been taken wholly by Christ. It's all been done. All of it, but only in the cross. There's nothing we can do to improve on this. There's nothing we can do to add this. We can't get better access to God than we already have in His Son. We can't be more fully restored than we already are in Christ. We've been dead and raised anew. There's no more restoration that you can add to that at all. In the cross alone, it's been finished. But that means something very important then for us. That the cross not only has dealt with the consequences of our sin, the judgment that we deserve, but in the cross, God is actually attacking the root of our sin, and that's our pride. The cross of Christ is not just God's giving grace to bring us to Him, it's also God's assault on human pride. God attacks our temptations towards self-reliance because there's nothing you can do to add or to, to gain more than what He's done. And that's really, as we go into verses 16 to 23, that's the main burden that the Apostle has for us. And if you get one thing this morning and only one thing, get that. The cross assaults your pride and beware of your pride taking you from the cross. That's the main burden that Paul has in this passage is all that's going on in all the first century religion. The main burden is that the cross is assaulting our self-reliance. What temptations is Paul warning against? And you realize here that Paul's warning us against temptations. Why else would he bother giving these warnings? He's writing to a church he's already told us in verse 5 is in good order and has firm faith. That must mean there's real temptations to real Christians for these things to succumb, to be captive to these philosophies. So these can't be things that any Christian would reject that are obvious, or else the the Apostle Paul wouldn't bother warning us about them. They must be real dangers because there's a subtle and insidious appeal to our pride, our independence, our self-reliance that remains and that is always open to being stroked and tickled and encouraged to grow. 
You see it here in this passage, the temptation in verse 16 to stand in judgment. Verse 18, to insist on your own way of worship, to indulge your conceit and your arrogance, even if there's no reason. In verse 19, not to have to grow with the whole body, but to have your own way of growth. Or in verse 23, as Paul concludes it, to have just an appearance of wisdom. To look good in a world that values self-made religion and severe discipline. The one burden that the Apostle Paul has, and if you get one thing today, is see the warning and danger of indulging your pride. Indulging your conceit. And your pride is a rebellion that will create religion. And it will create religion that looks really good. But it will create a religion that only glorifies yourself. And that's the great danger that the apostle warns us of. Because the Lord Jesus and his cross alone restores us, his cross also exposes our pride. It exposes our tendency to self-reliance. And it means that we need to refuse any other way of relying on self, even if it's religious. That self-reliance itself is something we need to be liberated from. That Christ has come to free us from. And here in this passage, the Holy Spirit is warning us about rituals and experiences or rules that appeal to our pride and threaten to remove us from the freedom of humble dependence on Christ alone. We have here really wound for us the paradox of the Christian life that liberty is found in absolute dependence, just as we've sung, willing bonds beneath his feet, that's liberty. And following our own way, that's bondage and captivity. And that's the warning of this passage, warning us about returning to captivity to ourselves. And we'll see this captivity warned to us in three ways. We see captivity in verses 16 and 17 in selective requirements. Selective requirements. In verses 18 to 19, superior regulations. Superior regulations. And in verses 20 to 23, the apostle sums it together as self-centered religion. Self-centered religion. Let's look first, and the first warning of captivity is verses 16 and 17, selective requirements. It was a little over 10 years ago, I was walking through the ruins of first century Bethsaida along the Sea of Galilee. It's amazing walking the streets the Lord Jesus himself likely walked on. And our group came to a synagogue from the period of the apostles and the Lord, the first century. And I noticed a carving on a pillar, and I walked over to that pillar, and I couldn't believe it. It was a face with a hair of snakes. It was Medusa, the Greek pagan monster on a Jewish synagogue in Galilee. I was stunned that there can't be Medusa on a Jewish synagogue. And our guide came up next to me as I was staring at it, and he said, yeah, archaeologists don't know what to do with that either. I've done some reading since, and it turns out they're actually all over. You look at synagogues in the first century and later, and there's pagan symbols all over them, actually. I was stunned. But what it does is really proves that what we don't know about religious belief and practice in the first century far outweighs what we do. Just like our day, people drew their beliefs from many religions and many practices and cultural assumptions. People rarely hold to any pure form of any religion. It's usually a combination, amalgamation of various things they learned and they bring together. And it seems that that's what was going on in the Colossians. You have here some basic Judaism that's evident throughout, most notably in verse 16 when we look at festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. But you also have severe disciplines and angel worship that sounds like pagan practices, pagan beliefs about visions and mystical experiences, but we know that the Jews incorporated many of these in their worship as well. What you have here is a gathering of religious assumptions gathered from the culture around And the problem is they've become the measuring stick of who really knows God. The assumption that in Christ things go just the way they've always done in our religions. And that these practices are the measuring stick of those who've really accessed God's favor. Those who really have life in God are those who follow these things. 
So they assumed, in verse 16, that the ritual traditions of Judaism were continuing. As Judaism spread into Gentile regions, like Colossae here from the land of Israel, Jews couldn't know if their food or drink was contaminated by idolatry. And you see this run throughout the New Testament. It was actually just a God's providence in our schedule, but we just read Romans 14 that's dealing with the exact same thing. The weak there are Jewish Christians who are only eating vegetables. Why are they only eating vegetables? Because they don't know if the meat was sacrificed to idols or not. And the same idea here. They don't know what foods or drinks, what wines have been contaminated by idolatry. So they created a whole system of dietary restrictions that far exceeded anything in the Old Testament. You won't find anything in the Old Testament that correlates to these things. But they became for them a basic identifier of whether or not you knew God. Eventually, it came down to whether or not you eat or don't eat this meat or drink or don't drink this wine. That determines whether you really know God or not. In the same way with all the holy days, festivals or Sabbaths or new moons, they, these were central for God's people to identify them in a pagan land. They saw, if you look down at verse 21, they saw what you tasted, what you touched, what you handled as enabling you as whether or not you could worship God, whether or not you were set apart enough to be in his presence. And anyone who refused them would be seen as condemned outside the presence of God. That's why Paul talks about in verse 16, passing judgment. That's not just criticizing someone. That's saying you're condemned by God. You are outside God's family. You don't know God because you have drinking this, you've eaten this, and it's impossible for you now to be in his presence because of that. And so as Jews professed Christ or became associated with Christianity, they just assumed that Christianity continued these practices because that was their default. I mean, surely to know God, you have to follow the same ritual diets, the same ritual calendar, don't you? But what Paul says here is to demand this is to exit the building and sit around the blueprints. That's what he says in verse 17. These things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The rituals and festivals of the Old Testament and the the separation of Israel by what they ate or didn't eat, they were the blueprints. They were pointing out the design of the salvation that was coming, what God was going to do in bringing his people, not just Jews, but Gentiles, the Gentiles that Paul said in chapter 1, verse 27, have Christ in them by faith. They were all designing, they were pointing to the salvation that God would accomplish in his son, Jesus. They were a shadow. They were a transitory outline of what was coming. But God's final purpose, his substance, was always Christ. The building's finished. Salvation's come. So don't leave the building to go stare at the blueprints anymore. Enjoy what God has done in Christ. The substance is done and finished in Him. Don't select other requirements that are beyond or outside Christ. You know, as we go over this, Paul's warning, though, in these verses is so regularly misunderstood and casually thrown around that we should probably really clarify what God is not saying here. And he's not saying at least two things. The first, he's not saying that Christians have no code of moral conduct. He's not saying that. He's not saying there's no code of moral conduct. Sometimes when a Christian is questioned about their behavior or certain behavior pattern, they immediately cry, legalism, don't pass judgment on me. But look down at chapter 3. And glance just at verse 5. Put to death what's earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Look at verse 8. You must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander. What do you have there? You have a code of moral conduct, but one that's consistent with Christ and one that was consistent with Him. We do have standards. We do have expectations. Later on in chapter 3, Paul will even tell Christians to instruct and admonish one another on the basis of his word and what he's done in Christ. We're called to make moral evaluations of behavior. 
We're called to lovingly question or confront others when their behavior seems inconsistent with what they profess about Christ and Christian wisdom in Him. Doing that's not legalism. That's love. That's how the church is called to live together. No, the issue here is taking traditions, traditions that have nothing to do with Christ, traditions that even exceed the Old Testament standards for God's people Israel, and using them as a standard is whether or not someone has life in Christ, that that is the baseline, that you can't be a Christian without this diet. Notice, though, Paul's not even forbidding Jewish Christians from maintaining this diet. He doesn't say it's wrong for them to do so. He's not forbidding them maintaining the ceremonial um, festivals and things as they've been fulfilled in Christ. That's not forbidden for Jewish Christians. What was absolutely wrong and inexcusable was demanding that Gentiles had to do them in order to be legitimate before God. And our only legitimacy before God is Christ. That's what Paul is clarifying here. The second thing to clarify that he's not saying God is not saying that the church has no calendar for worship. God is not saying that the church has no calendar. In creation, God established one day in seven for our rest and worship of him. In Israel, it was codified as the seventh day, the Sabbath, on Saturday. But when Christ arose and the Spirit was sent on the first day of the week, and the New Testament goes out of its way to repeat it was the first day of the week, Christian worship was centered on that fulfillment on the first day of the week, what the Apostle John calls the Lord's Day, the day that belongs to him, Sunday. Many, however, will cite this passage right here to argue against that, that there can be no day of worship. Christians can never be obligated to prioritize worship on the Lord's Day because the Bible says, let no one pass judgment on a Sabbath. But that is really to find more in this passage than the Holy Spirit ever put there. Paul forbids here imposing a Jewish ceremonial calendar on the church. He's forbidding the Jewish ceremonial calendar and imposing that on the church. He says nothing about abolishing a weekly calendar of worship. He says nothing about abolishing the weekly rhythm that God sowed into creation and that has been fulfilled in the Lord's day in Christian worship. The controversy was over the Jewish observance of the Sabbath, not on the Christian worship of Christ on the Lord's day, not on the Christian Sunday. So you can never read verse 16 as canceling out other verses in Scripture or as though Hebrews 10.25, that we are not to neglect to meet each other, that we can't hold one another accountable to that because of this verse. It doesn't suggest to us that our rest and worship in Christ on the Lord's day is an option or some elective. The Lord's day is not a part of the shadow. It's part of the substance of worshiping God in Christ. Whereas B.B. Warfield put it so well, Christ took the Sabbath into the grave with him, And he brought the Lord's day out of the grave with him in the resurrection. And that is what we worship. And Paul is not negating that. Not saying the church has no calendar for worship. So what is he saying there? What's the burden here? That's simply what we've seen. Don't add requirements to gain life in Christ. Don't add requirements that we select to gain life in Christ. All you need to do to be right with God and have life with Him is Christ. You need Him. You need to be in Him. You need to trust Him. You need to depend on Him. You need to call out to Him in faith. That's all you need to do to have life with God is trust Jesus Christ. If you know you don't have life with God this morning, you can have it by trusting Jesus Christ. There's nothing cultural or ritual else you need to do to gain that life. Trust Christ. What Paul is emphasizing here is the gospel really is for everyone and anyone. It's for everyone. And unlike every other religious claim on the planet and in human history, 
You don't have to become something else before you can be understood as free in Christ. You just need Christ. You need to trust Him. Maybe in today and in our culture, we need to be reminded about this in the re- arena of social and political views. More and more, I seem to hear from Christians, if you disagree about this issue, well, then you're probably not a Christian. I hear that at an alarming rate. But that is spiritual insanity. And that's not doing anything functionally different from what was going on here in Colossae. There are political, ethnic, there are no political, ethnic, social, national requirements to becoming a Christian. Absolutely none. You do not have to become anything else than who you are in those areas other than trust Christ. And we can never impose any other requirements. Well, how can we tell if we may be guilty or tempted toward passing judgment ourselves? One way might be just to ask ourselves a question. Who do you refer to as those people? And don't react like you never think that way. You do. (laughs) What groups of people do you refer to as those people? Those people. Who is that in your mind? Maybe it's Democrats. Maybe it's Republicans. Maybe it's people who voted for Trump or who refused to. Maybe it's people who go to public schools or people who don't. Maybe it's a certain social class or educational standard. Maybe it's the poor. Maybe it's the powerful. Whoever it is in your mind that you refer to, you know, is you know, those people. And then ask yourself, what do those people need to do in order to be right with God? And if your answer is anything else but faith in Christ, repent of your legalism. That is your legalism. That is what was going on in Colossae. That is the temptation that Paul is warning against even in ourselves. About adding requirements that are outside just faith in Christ and trusting Him and making us whole in Him. So we're warned against first, selective requirements. Secondly, in verses 18 to 19, superior regulations. Superior regulations. Along with these requirements, there is this danger of submitting in verse 18 to those who would disqualify them by their demand for asceticism and the worship of angels. Now you notice that pair, asceticism and worship of angels, is repeated in verse 23. Self-made religion, it's the same word translated worship in verse 18, and asceticism. So they seem to go together and experience. And it wasn't uncommon in this day, in the first century, to understand that if you severely treated your body, and asceticism likely here refers to severe fasting or some extreme level of fasting, if you treated your body severely, that prepared you for a spiritual experience. That's the idea that the body, the physical body, is what's holding us back. So if we mistreat it and show our mastery over our body, severely deprive ourselves in fastings, then we can encounter the divine. We could even maybe have visions and the worship of the angels. It's a rigorous denial here of what's physical so you could be qualified to enter the spiritual. You could know God and his full blessing by how severely you treated yourself and enter into these spiritual experiences. But what's the real motivation behind all these rigorous regulations? To be admired by others. Look at verse 18. The worship of angels going on in detail about visions, going on and on and preoccupied with their deep experiences. They are, Paul says, puffed up, conceited, and that for no reason is baseless. There's no reality to it. It's all coming, end of verse 18, from their sensuous mind, literally their fleshly mind, their mind of the flesh. Do you see what he's getting at? These rules, they feign humility. They look really impressive when someone would deprive themselves of food and fast for extended time. But Paul sees right through it through the lens of the cross. What's really going on here is pride. It's pride that's fueling this effort. It's self-reliance. It's their own achievements, so they'd be mired by others. People would be impressed with their visions. 
And, and, and when Paul talking about these, these people going on in detail about their visions, it's quite a contrast to him. If you remember 2 Corinthians 12, or you might want to read it later, where Paul, he doesn't even want to talk about it. He actually was caught up to heaven, and he says, I don't even want to talk about it. What I want to talk about is my weakness and suffering and how God's made me humble in it. I'll tell you all about that. I don't want to talk about my visions. So you see here, Paul is calling it like it is. And that's what Paul says, the ultimate problem here, verse 19, they're not holding fast to the head. The ultimate problem here is, is they're not holding fast to who's the head. It's Christ, right? Remember verse 10, you've been completed in him. Who is what? The head, the head of all rule and authority. We, you remember verse 18 of chapter one, he's the head of the body, the church. They're not holding fast to the head who's completed you. So they're professing Christianity, but they're, they're not really holding to Christ. They don't grasp the completion of the work he's done. They think they can add to it. They think they can gain greater access to God than Christ has already given them by his death and resurrection. It is Christ who fills them. He brings us to God. He's God who came to us bodily to bring us back into him. And then Paul goes on in verse 19 with just a brilliant, subtle rebuke and reminder that holding to Christ in faith is how we all grow. Look at verse 19. Holding fast to the head from whom the whole body being nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows. How does God grow his church? It's not through severe discipline of the body. It's not through visions and special experiences that you can tell everybody about. It's holding fast and depending on Christ. As every member depends and holds to Christ, we're nourished and knit together or united. And through joints and ligaments, and, and Paul's using that body metaphor to refer to the relationships Christians have to one another in the church. We, we are joined together by his spirit. The joints and ligaments is our relationships. So we nourish each other through his word and pointing each other to Christ. Paul's describing the connection that Christians have to one another. He uses this same idea in Ephesians chapter 4. Listen to verses 15 and 16. Paul writes, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's Ephesians 4, the same idea is here, real growth, true spiritual height and experience comes by depending on Christ by relying on Him. It comes as truth is spoken to us by the joints and ligaments of His body, that is, other Christians. And in our relationships with other Christians, as they speak His truth in love, we grow. The body's built in love. That's how God, end of verse 19, grows His church. His truth is lovingly spoken. The word of His Son is spoken so that people depend on Him, and then they grow in Him. Paul's saying you can't grow without Christ. You can't grow without depending on Christ. And he's also saying you can't grow without other Christians. And that's really the challenge here, isn't it? What these people who experienced these visions and had these extreme asceticism, what they wanted to be was to be different, to have their own track, have a superior path to growth. And Paul says, no, this is how the whole body grows including himself. We all grow just by depending on Christ. And we all grow as we depend on Christ's word from one another. That's how God grows his church. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Because it's very, very humbling. Our pride doesn't like that. The allure of these false teachers and these experiences to offer to be above the whole body to not submit to what seems weak and unspiritual, about words spoken by, by ordinary people, just people that don't, can't claim what I can claim. We can have an alternate track, a superior one. The temptation here is to have a track of spirituality that meets our expectations about ourselves, that we really are better than everyone else, and we don't need 
what everyone else needs. We need something better. We need the honors course to God through asceticism, worshiping angels, visionary experiences. And it says, no, no. You need Christ and you need his body that his word would come to you. That's how God grows his church. Now today, we probably wouldn't argue for extreme fasting or to worship angels. I've, I've never heard of that. But we do seek ways to prove what we still believe deep down, that we are superior. You can look at the current list of top 10 best-selling books, the top 10 list published by the Christian Publishers Association. And it has titles on it about seeking mystical experiences. It has testimonies of how people rose to success. And it has a lot of self-help. Interesting, in the times I've checked in on this list, there's never been a single book about the gospel that's made the top 10 bestseller list. In fact, when author and theologian Mark Jones was looking to publish his excellent book, Knowing Christ, he shared that he was once warned by a publisher, just to caution you, books about Christ don't sell very well. So just be prepared. Christ and his gospel have never sold very well. And the reason for that is because what he requires is our humility. Our humility to humbly grasp him in faith alone. To hang on to him by faith. To humbly submit to his word spoken by normal people like me. Completely ordinary, fallen, frail. The word of God comes to you. That takes humility to receive that. It takes humility to grasp and depend on him alone with no other outward things around us. When a friend, a barber, asked Martin Luther how he could grow more in prayer and knowing Christ, Luther wrote him a letter and he began it by saying this, when I feel like I've become cold and joyless in prayer, I take my little psalter and I hurry to my room, or if it's the day and hour for it, I go to the church where a congregation is assembled. Where does a great Christian like Luther go? To the Word. To the church. Don't miss the priority that Luther gave to the assembled church. He said, if the church is gathered, I go there. And I hear his word. And I receive it. What do we need to know God? To experience him. To grow in him. To be in his presence. To be assured that we are spiritual and that we know him and that God is for us and he hears us and we know him. Just Christ by faith. Christ by faith in his word. Just trusting his word. It's humbling, isn't it? It attacks our pride. It attacks our sense of superiority. If we were creating a religion, it wouldn't be this. It would be something entirely different that made us look so good. And we know that's the case because every religion created by men is something other than this. Just trusting Christ according to his word. Depending on him. Our confession in chapter 14 speaks of saving faith like this. Faith is ordinarily produced by the ministry of the word. By this same ministry... And by the administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, prayer, and other means appointed by God, faith is increased and strengthened. It's so ordinary. Christ by faith and his word. And yet that is God's power to grow his body. That's how his people grow. How should that impact how you seek God? How should that alter the priorities you place on hearing his word in the church, on the relationships you cultivate with other Christians that you might speak his word to them and they might speak his word to you. Is this what you think of when you think of knowing God? Faith and the Bible. That is how God grows his church. <clears throat> Nothing superior. And we should view this as profound grace to us. Life in Christ is so simple. It's so available. It's so available to all of us. Just hold fast to Christ and receive his word. Just trust him. Go to him 
when he gathers his church and when he speaks forth his word when we are gathered. Go to him as he speaks his word through one another. It's so simple. It's so available. But it does require one thing. You're humble. You receive it. You submit to the ways, the ordinary ways that he grows us. It requires that we put off our pride. It requires we put off our feelings of superiority. That we put off the thought that I need something special. My problems and issues are too unique. No, they're not. You need Christ and his word. Receive him. The third warning we have and what concludes it all in verses 20 to 23 is the warning against self-centered religion. To be held captive by self-centered religion. Paul is summarizing all of it and he shows how contradictory it is, how much it contradicts what he's already said in verses 11 to 15. And specifically what he outlines in these three verses is two things. It cuts contradictory because it belongs to a world that's perishing and a wisdom that's powerless. That's his main burden in these verses. You're submitting to something that belongs to a world that's perishing and a wisdom that's powerless. He says, remember, in verse 20, bringing us back to verses 11 to 15, remember in Christ you died. You died to the elemental spirits of the world. Remember verse 15? He disarmed them. He put them to open shame. They have no more claim on you because your sin is forgiven in Christ. So if you died to the elemental spirits of the world, if you have victory over them, why submit to demonic lies that you can work your way to God? Why submit to these thinkings of men? Why act, verse 20, as if you were still alive in the world? That is to say, if you were still living in the pattern of this world, as if you were still following how this world thinks, this world that's under the power of the evil one. Why live that way any war? Why submit to these regulations that he lists in verse 21 for effect? All of them that are related to purity and in ritual standards, trusting that by why you don't contact and what you do sets you apart for God. But Paul says no. Verse 21 to 22, you've got two problems here. First, these rituals refer to all things that all perish. And with that word perish, Paul uses a word that he repeats throughout the New Testament to refer to the destruction of the world, the judgment that's coming, this perishing world, this world that's passing away. Why are you so concerned about things that God's going to dissolve in his judgment, that we're going to use up and are going to pass away? That's your first problem. Your second problem, verse 22, is they're according to human precepts and teachings. And here at the end of verse 22, Paul is just quoting Jesus. He's quoting Jesus who rebuked the Pharisees in Mark 7 and elsewhere of teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Paul used the same language here. The Pharisees thought how they washed their hands and cleaned their utensils was what showed how they were in the presence of God. And Paul says, that's just how men think. That's not how God thinks. That's not what God has said. It's not from him. So in essence, what Paul is warning about in these three verses is you're just rearranging deck chairs on a sinking ship. You're painting a building that's already marked for demolition. Why are you doing this? Why are you tying your thoughts and practices to a a perishing world with men under judgment? These are the very things from which Christ has set you free. Don't submit to them anymore. Don't submit to this way of thinking anymore. Now again, just to clarify, is Paul saying that spiritual people have no care for this life? Absolutely not. Again, look at chapter 3. He's going to show how to live in this world very practically. But the massive difference is that how what he shows is actual change. Look at verse 9, for example, of chapter 3, where Paul says, Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self that is in Christ, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. It's actual change that Paul's talking about, real world change. But the things that they're submitting to or tempted to, they don't change anybody. It's just a sideshow. 
external things in a perishing world, none of these practices put to death what is earthly. And that's what Paul's concerned about. Look at verse 5 of chapter 3. Put to death what is earthly in you. Immorality, impurity, covetousness, idolatry. These practices just keep you in them. They don't change you. You're dealing with what's perishing. You're not cultivating what's actually eternal, who you are in Christ. So Paul's not saying Christians don't care for this life. He says Christians actually change in this life. The things you're submitting to don't change anyone. They're just external practices. And if you keep submitting to them, you will just perish with them when the wrath of God comes. It belongs to a world that's perishing. And secondly, in verse 23, it belongs to a wisdom that's powerless. They come from a powerless wisdom. What wisdom do these rules and religion have going for them? Verse 23, just an appearance. They have indeed an appearance of wisdom. And that's the most important word in that entire verse. It, they give you a reputation. Or as Calvin wisely observed, it's all just a show. It's a show. It's a performance. They give you the opportunity to perform. You can have a, a self-made religion, freely chosen worship. Or as the old King James well translated, it's will worship. You get to worship your own will. And people admire that. People will admire you. Sinful men will appreciate that because it operates on the same level of they do, the same pride and the same reliance that they live in. And so they will admire your religion. You look so spiritual. People will recognize you be for being so religious, especially when you have, in verse 23, asceticism, when you're severe to the body, when you demonstrate such control and mastery over yourself, people will travel to visit with you. People still do. We're impressed by all these things that people could so severely treat themselves. But it's all just an appearance. It's just a show. It's just to be admired by others. And how do you know? End of verse 23. It has no value in actually stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It does nothing for your actual sin. And how could it? Glance back over this section where you're engaged in requirements in verse 16 that men select. When verse 18, you're arrogant about your superior rules. And in verse 23, when you're so concerned about how you appear before others as wise and spiritual, what's being grown? Only your flesh. Only your pride. With man-made attempts at religion and spirituality, all you're doing is pouring gas on the fire of your pride. Letting that rebellion burn before God, even in your religion, burning in rebellion against Him. Lifting your pride. Extreme fasting doesn't defeat the flesh. Who defeats the flesh? Back to verse 11. Christ, who put off the body of the flesh, and you died in Him. How are you raised to heaven? By your visions and experiences? No. Verse 12, you're raised with him through faith. You're raised in Christ. Christ brings you to God. Christians grow, verse 13, by God's work. God makes you alive together with him. And these external actions can never create internal motivations. They can never change you. They won't. They're just another exercise in relying on yourself. And there's no fixing ourselves. There's no fixing us by ourselves. There's only throwing all of us on Christ. There's only trusting Him wholly in what He has done. Trusting Christ and grasping that we've died and risen in Him. That we trust Him alone. And what Christ produces is not self-reliance. What Christ produces is is deep, absolute, and utter dependence. Absolute dependence on Him. Willing bonds beneath His feet. Christian growth, unlike the expectations of the world, is not growth and in independence. 
Christian maturity does not look like physical maturity. When you mature physically, eventually you move out, leave your house, and you, your parents, and you establish your own life. Christian maturity is the exact opposite. Christian maturity is growing downward, more deeply tied to Christ, recognizing how much more you need to stay in his house and hold only on to him. It's growing more and more dependent, more and more realizing what absolute dependence you need, how utterly untrustful trustful you are. But that produces actual change, change that Paul will talk about next in chapter 3. Things like verse 12 and kindness and humility, meekness and patience. It never produces arrogance. It never produces self-absorbed anger. It produces absolute dependence on him in humility. The question that God raises for us in his word is not whether or not we'll worship. It's who we will worship. Because we will worship. We will either worship God in truth through the Lord Jesus Christ or we will worship ourselves. And those are the two options before us. Those are the only two options in this world. Every other religion and philosophy in the world, even some that go under the banner of Christianity, every other religion and philosophy in this world outside of absolute dependence by faith in Jesus Christ is just a form of worshiping ourselves. It's a form of self-worship. We can be quite religious and have nothing to do with God at all. And just as much as the Colossians did, we need these warnings. We need these reminders against our own pride. The temptation is so subtle and it's ever-present for all of us. You see it in our circles. It's on the ministry website that advertises a pastor as being all about Jesus with two paragraphs following about how impressive a speaker he is and sought out by everybody and all all kinds of accolades. It's in the Christian leaders who take journeys into authenticity and humility with YouTube videos and blogs so that the whole world can watch and follow just how humble they've become. We don't get it. It's not about us. The cross is not just dealing with the consequences of our sin. The cross is assaulting your pride and saying, you have nothing. And the warnings that Paul brings us is a reminder, you have nothing. Don't submit to anyone who says that you do and that you can add to this. Don't submit to turning things into a show. We are all tempted to construct a religion that is more concerned with how we appear to others than who we are before God. And we are warned against it. That's the warning that God is sounding. To have discernment, to see through the external trappings of things, and to see the illusion of spirituality and to call it for what it really is, reliance on self. In his cross, the Lord Jesus not just liberates us, he frees us. He attacks also our pride. He drives us in one important way, to despair. To despair of ourselves. Christ wants us to despair of ourselves. When Martin Luther expanded on his statement, the cross alone is our theology, he wrote, it is certain a man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. And the consequence, of course, he wrote is, he is not righteous who does much, but he who without work believes much in Christ. In all of our discipline, in all of our actions, in all of our worship, if it's true and real, it will be to keep us firmly lashed to the cross of Christ, that we have nothing outside of him, and we have no hope except what he's done at the cross. It really is that the cross alone is our theology. Let's pray. Father, we pray your word would accomplish the fruit you intend by your power. We pray even that an insufficient exposition would
by your spirit result in sufficient fruit and growth and change in the lives of your people who are here by faith. Father, we pray your son would be exalted as he's done it all. And we pray that we would be freed from the props that we would put up under ourselves to grasp the freedom of humility and relying on your son. We pray that liberty would belong to everyone here this morning, Father, and we pray for whom it does not, you would bring them to yourself. You would give them all the fitness they require to feel their need of Christ, that they would trust him. And we pray, Father, that you and you alone would belong the glory, for you have done it all. And we ask this in Christ's most holy name. Amen.